so welcome everybody. We're talking tonight, doing our Facebook live uh, in the evening rather than the middle of the day, like we often do, and talking about the perennial topic of desire differences. This is a topic that is really common common to bringing couples in to uh, get help from a counselor or a coach uh, because it can be a particularly painful topic in marriage and one that it can be really hard to know how to address. So, um, and I think one of the reasons why it can be so painful is that, well, there's myriad reasons, but for starters, sex is just really close to the bone, so to speak. It's it's very personal to us. And so, you know, we get married usually, right? At least in Western culture, we get married because we say, you're special to me. I am attracted to you. I want to touch you. I want to be touched by you. And I want to share this part of me that I don't want to share with other people, my sexuality. And so that's the founding meaning for most modern marriages is that it's a romantic meaning. I choose you and you choose me. And so it's what makes it different than other love relationships and other familial relationships. And so sex is an important expression of that feeling, right? That I want to be close to you. I like you. I'm attracted to you. You compel me, right? Um, you know, you, you drive me crazy with desire, right? That's a very validating meaning that's often very alive when we're dating. Sometimes too alive, more alive than we want it to be, but very much a kind of framing reality. And so when you get married and then your spouse doesn't desire you, doesn't want to be close to you, isn't that interested when you are, right? That can be a very painful meaning. Why don't you desire me? And we often frame that as, oh, you always want sex. Like, come on, can't you, you know, read a few scriptures and, and, you know, get a little more spiritual like me, you know, so we can often shame it like that. It's just about hedonism and just about orgasm and just about, uh, you know, the superficial reality of pleasure when in fact, it's so much more than that. And that's why it's so painful. It's not just about having an orgasm. It's about, do you desire me? Do you love me? Do you want to be close to me? Right? Or it's like, oh, I love you, but I'm not attracted to you. Okay. Well, what does that mean in marriage? That's, that doesn't, that's cold comfort. Okay. <laughs> you love me, but you don't want me to touch you. That doesn't mean anything. And so, or it means very little because wait, who are we? I thought we, chose each other, that we're attracted to each other. And are you telling me you're not? So it's really painful to be in the higher desire position in that dynamic. And it's easy to handle oneself poorly, which we'll talk about more in a minute, when you're in that place of feeling rejected or feeling like you can't get your partner to respond to you or desire you. Now, it's also painful often for the low desire person, because sex is also personal for the low desire person. And it's often true that you feel like, like, I, this is more intense than I want. This feels too invasive, too intrusive, too, like, I, I want to belong to my own life. I don't want to have to manage you and all your sexual feelings and all those fantasies you want to talk about. And like, can we just like talk about something else? Can we just watch a movie? Like, can't we be together in other ways? <laughs> and because for the low desire person, they often feel intruded upon. Like, I just, I, I don't want to have to manage all of that. It's not that fun for me. It's not whatever experience you're having. I'm just not having because I don't want it. Okay. And, and it's a legit position, right? It's like, you know, and so one of the things that Dr. Schnarch, a mentor of mine w talked about um, a lot is that as human beings, more than we want to have sex, we want to belong to our own sense of self, right? As human beings, we have a sense of agency and psychological autonomy. And while we want to be close to others and we want to feel desired and we want to feel that we belong to our group and to our marriage, we don't 
we don't want it at the expense of our autonomy, that sense that we belong to our own lives and our own body autonomy and our own reality. And if being sexual makes you feel like you can't belong to your own life, right? That you have to manage your spouse's feelings, right? That you have to kind of accommodate them when you feel some repulsion around it, right? That's very, very difficult to do because it feels like a sort of self betrayal, right? And so, both higher desire and lower desire person have legit positions. And a lot of times people want to say, higher desire people often want to say, you know, my spouse has got issues with sex. And sometimes they do, okay? Because that's another reason here that we can touch on is not only is sex close to the bone, right? Uh, sex is also kind of weird and therefore kind of loaded in our religious culture, not kind of, maybe a lot loaded. <laughs> okay. Um, it's, uh, you know, that we equate pleasure with evil or sexuality with evil or like sexuality is how Satan gets a hold of you is through your sexuality. And so we're often really not at peace with our sexual nature, whether we're the higher desire or the lower desire person. Um, we're often confused about, is it okay to think sexual thoughts? Is it okay to fantasize? Is it okay to do something other than missionary position sex once a week after reading the scriptures, right? Is it, is, is it okay? And often in that uncertainty, because we don't really think of God as being a being who really embraces the body and sensuality and pleasure. That often in our ambivalence about that, even as the higher desire person, I, I know plenty of high desire, like obsessed people with sex actually, who are deeply conflicted about whether or not sex is a good thing. So your desire level is not a good indicator of how much peace you have with sexuality, right? But the larger point here is that when we are ambivalent about whether or not sexuality is good, we are often bringing that anxiety into our marriage. It's playing itself out there. We're often looking for validation from the other person to make sex be okay, right? Want it also so that I can feel okay about wanting it or don't want it because it gives, makes me so uncomfortable. Why do you have to want it? I just want you to like, leave me alone. I want you to want me but just leave me alone about it, okay? I don't want somebody else, right? And so that's also another layer that's often playing itself out in these desire dynamics that can be confusing and painful. Um, and so I was gonna say just one more thought before I take some of the questions uh, that, that have come in, but um, the other thing that can be really hard about these desire differences and how to address them is that they can actually get more punctuated than they actually are in some sort of quantifiable sense. So that is to say, you might've been somebody who actually felt like sex could be a good thing. I think I could like it. But then you got married and your spouse wanted sex a lot, you know, and never seem to be happy. And then we get kind of critical when you didn't want to have it as much as they did. And then your desire started plummeting even more. Right. And so what often, and maybe your higher desire spouse, theirs even got more punctuated. They started to want it even more than they would have otherwise. Right. Because when the meanings of self get entangled, right? Like I can't even belong to my own life. You want sex. If I just like even move when I'm lying next to you, you, want, you know, then, then you're, then it starts to get exaggerated, which becomes its own pain point. So, um, so anyway, so this, that, that can be a third thing is that then it gets exaggerated and then really becomes a source of pain. Now, before I take some questions, I'm going to say one more thing. <laughs> I always have one more point is that one of the, in the two couples courses that I teach, um, the, the enhancing sexual intimacy and strengthening your relationship. One of the foundational ideas is how we handle ourselves when we're not getting what we want, right? When our spouse isn't validating us in the way we want them to, that determines the intimacy of the marriage. 
that determines how collaborative a marriage can be. Because most of us don't handle ourselves well at all when we're disappointed, right? A lot of us have come into marriage not with the promise to God that we're going to love this person, bring our best to our spouse, and do what's needed for their benefit. Most of us come into the marriage with the idea, good, I locked them in before they knew too much. They just promised God they're going to love me for eternity no matter what. <laughs> I mean, we don't admit this to ourselves, but, you know, that's what we're kind of imagining. Like, now you have to love me because you promised in the temple. Like, bro, you've got to do it now. So <laughs> we're very seldom thinking about our obligation. We're often thinking much more about what we're hoping we're going to get in marriage. And in reality, that's not what marriage is about. I mean, yes, we're when we're fortunate, we are loved by someone who really chooses us. But marriage is about often managing and accommodating difference. We're attracted to difference. And in order to do that well, you have to tolerate that you're often not going to get what you want. And how do I work with this aggravating other that I still am very attracted to and love? <laughs> And work out a partnership. How do we collaborate together around the fact that we're two very different people and want different things often? And how do we work as a partnership nonetheless, especially around something like sex? And see, if we can't regulate our own frustration, disappointment, feelings of rejection, fears, anxieties, right? If we're so dependent upon authority that we're looking outside the marriage all the time to, to you know, to manage the question of who we should be to a point of not actually addressing the marriage, right? We interfere with our ability to actually partner and to create something that's a real friendship, to create something that's in fact intimate through our sexuality, through our relationship. So, so the way that you know, I'm going to be taking up specific questions now to help you see more what I mean here. But many of us are not prepared to actually be a collaborative friend in marriage. We are ready to punish when we don't get what we want. We're ready to pout when we don't get what we want. We're ready to maybe just accommodate, but our heart's not in it. And not really choose our partner. Many of us don't want to deal with the gift of our sexuality and consider how to create goodness with it and what that means in our marriage. And so marriage asks us to grow up. Marriage pushes us to grow up and learn how to love if we'll let it. And so that's really the foundational idea that's going to be in all of my responses here. But I'll take up some questions and see, you know, how those actually, what they actually what these ideas actually mean. Okay, I'll answer a couple and then I'll see if there's questions coming in. And Christy, you can always, you know, tell me if somebody's put something in the chat that is relevant. Um, okay, so this person writes, I'm the higher desire partner and my wife is the lower desire partner, married over 10 years. We've both done a lot of work of not accepting duty sex, et cetera. And I would say our sex life is great, two to three times a week, both orgasm, et cetera. However, recently my wife admitted that although she enjoys sex because she knows it's important for me, she gets very little pleasure out of it, except for maybe the 10 to 20 seconds before she orgasms, and then she's done and just wants to move on with other activities. All forms of foreplay, massage, touching, oral, and intercourse don't bring any sort of pleasure or even feelings of arousal, and she would rather just use a vibrator, climax, and be done. I've done the Art of Loving course, which is the men's course, and would love to ravish my wife, but I'm having a really hard time staying grounded and engaged when she's admitted that she doesn't feel any real desire for sex or arousal towards me at all. I love my wife, and physical touch is my love language. I know how much you, Jennifer, love those. <laughs> okay, all right. I'm not a love language hater. It's just not my favorite framework. Okay. So it's pretty hurtful to feel like what I want to give isn't even wanted. Yeah, for sure. I feel like I'm torn between wanting to act in integrity, which is to be physically affectionate with my wife, but also wanting to withdraw because she doesn't want, let alone feel arousal or pleasure from anything I do. 
what advice would you give both of us in this situation? So just to go to that integrity point for just a second, just to address that, and then I'll go back to the larger question. I feel I'm torn between wanting to act in integrity, which is to be physically affectionate with my wife. What I think you're saying there is I desire her, right? I desire to touch her. I like if I'm referencing what I really feel who I am in integrity, like I desire her and want to be close to her, but also wanting to withdraw because she doesn't want, let alone feel arousal or pleasure from anything I do. But what you're also saying is that she's not receiving it. Okay, so even though it may be fully legitimate that I desire her and want to touch her, the problem is it it may not be any longer in integrity to touch her because she's saying, I don't really desire it. It doesn't do much for me, right? So integrity, just to make that point, is it's not just what I feel. It's like, it's yes, it is what I feel, but what is the right thing to do given that she's basically saying, I don't want it? And that's important in terms of determining what is the right thing? What does my integrity dictate in this very difficult situation where I desire her and she doesn't desire me back? Okay, now I'll come back to that perhaps in just a second, but I'm gonna go back to some of this here. So what I think you're describing is that your wife, she's getting aroused um, even if she doesn't feel aroused. So that is to say her body is getting aroused because she is orgasming. And so her body's in response to the touch, but it sounds like she doesn't feel desire. She feels arousal. I mean, she may not even notice that she's aroused, but her body's in a state of arousal, which is not chosen. But she doesn't feel desire, which is, I want to be sexual here. I like this. I enjoy this. I want to show up here. And, um, and it sounds like what she's really trying to do is get through the act of sex without showing up for it, without really being there. And the question I think for you is why does my wife not want to be there? And that's an important question to inform your integrity, right? To inform what is the right thing for me to do? Because why does why is her why is there a wall? that's up when she's engaging with me sexually. And there may be a few reasons, and I'll just throw out what some of them may be. Um, one reason why, you know, there's people that they want to be chosen, but they don't want to choose. They want, they don't want their spouse to go and desire elsewhere. They don't want the sexuality to be expressed outside the marriage, but so want me, but I don't want to actually desire you. I don't want to step in. I don't want to actually make love to you to let my, you know, I might, might want to, you know, open up to have intercourse, but not open my heart. And so there is a wall that is kind of a way of keeping control in a marriage. And usually when someone's, and I don't know what the right answer is for your wife and your situation, but a lot of times somebody has that wall when they know that this person keeps pursuing, I don't have to really step in. I mean, they're not scheming. It's just intuitive. I can be kind of closed because you're so busy trying to get close to me that I can, you know, I have the latitude to not really step in with two feet and I can sort of take advantage of what I can track as your desire and not have to admit or step in or invest in loving you back as long as I know that you're going to revolve around me, right? Um, it can be so about that. It can also be about, you know, I am it can be all these reasons. It can be that I don't want to let myself have sexual thought and feeling. I feel anxious about it. N not just because of maybe whether or not I choose you, but just letting myself have sexual thoughts and feelings, nurturing those thoughts and feelings. Really, I mean, I don't know how people can have a thriving sexual relationship if they fear that having sexual thoughts is letting in sin. And a lot of my clients do fear that and feel that. 
because I think about sex all the time. I mean, especially when I'm having it, that is to say, I don't know how else you get aroused except to encourage sexual thought, especially when your body's not just doing it for you. You know, when you're in your twenties, your body's just doing it for you. But once you get older, you know, and you've got dishes and kids and distractions, you know, you have to be pretty comfortable cultivating a relationship to your eroticism to be able to be an invested partner in creating something pleasurable for two people. But a third reason, and now I've suddenly lost it. So there's, there's, I can, I cannot really invest because I know you're invested. Oh yeah, I've got it. Okay. The second is I'm anxious about thinking sexual thought or letting my body really take it in and really letting myself be there and having you witness it for that matter. But then a third reason can be, and these can all operate together is it feels suffocating with you. I don't want to show up because I'm afraid you'll swallow me whole. Okay. So that is if you're high desire, if you're with a higher desire person and they are kind of um, life sucking, you know, that they're, they're taking their, it doesn't feel like you're being made love to. It feels like you're being, you know, energy is being taken from you, right? That they're trying to fill up their own sense of self through being sexual. Then it's going to be very easy to have sex. So your partner doesn't feel bad, but not really be there for it. Not really step in because you're afraid you'll get consumed. Now, this often works as a dynamic. And so the more that the lower desire person walls, the more the higher desire person starts to kind of pursue and attempt to get permeate that wall, which makes them want to wall off more. And so, you know, all of a sudden you're just in this kind of power struggle, an unspoken one in sex, and it is painful for both people. And so, you know, I'm going to go to another question here in a second that kind of is a, I think dovetails well with this one, but you know, I was working with a client who was low desire. She feels smothered all the time by her husband, just the way he would kiss her. Right. And, and he, in his defense felt like, you know, my wife never wants to be with me. If it were up to her, we never would have had sex, you know, ever. We would just be in a sexless marriage. And, um, and it's true. I mean, she had plenty of reasons to be afraid of sex and not like it, but, you know, she would just kind of accommodate and wall and, so I was talking to her about that and, she, you know, helping her see what she was doing. And um, she made the decision that she wanted to just step in more and to stop just always being like this position in their sexual engagement. So he started kissing her. It felt like she was being kind of smothered in the normal way, what she didn't like. But rather than pull away, she just leaned in and kissed him back. And really, like, moved out of the passive position and into an active position. And he immediately noticed and immediately stepped back, right? That, like, he didn't keep pursuing because now she's engaged. He's not trying to get her to be there. She's just there. And so she, like, single handedly shifted the whole experience of the kiss because now she's not just being acted upon, she's acting. And he's not smothering her because he can tell she's actually there and choosing to be there. And so he settles down. Right. And it didn't have to start with her. It can start with the one who's suffocating or in pursuit by not going over the line and trying to get them to want you, but maybe naming more like, I want you and I want a good sexual relationship with you, but it's not clear to me that you also want it. And I want to ravish you. I want to make love to you, but it's not clear to me that you are invested in, in something closer. Now, the lower desire person might say like, look, I want to, it. it's like my body just won't do it. And, you know, there is truth in the fact that there are differences in people's um, hormonal levels and sort of disposition around sex, but the meaning that we bring is extremely important. You know, like it, that client, was, whenever it was in the I'm getting acted upon, that's just like linked to a whole like rebellious anger in her because of her own history. And 
she would play out that meaning and her body would just, she'd be like, you know, like stone cold. But when she started being an, an actor and a chooser and feeling like she was actually had some control in her life and some control in the marital dynamic, some control of herself, well, her body started responding very differently because our brain is our most important sex organ. Okay, so um, so let me just pull in another question that's related to this. Um, so I just need to find it. Well, so this is a similar kind of question. How can I help my spouse open up about her desire? Well, their desires. I don't know who's male or female. Uh, how can I get my help my spouse open up about their desires when the only reply I receive is I don't have any fantasies. Can a person really have no fantasies? I struggle with this concept because my spouse struggled with masturbation at one point. So clearly the wheels can turn. Well, technically speaking, yes, there are people that have no fantasies. Um, and there's like three different frames in which people can engage sexually. One is like just through sensation, like the sensation of the body. The other is through just the feeling of affection and love and desire for one's partner. So partner engagement. And the third frame is fantasy. And I don't have the percentage off the top of my head of what percentage of people use fantasy, but most people have some meaning or fantasy. Like it's basically because meaning so powerful in our arousal, it's going and taking a meaning that we like and playing with that meaning, right? Playing with a story in our mind, a story between you and your spouse. Um, but I have a good friend who really enjoys sex and she never ever fantasizes. She's like, sometimes I think about nature. I'm like, nature? <laughs> like, what the heck? Like, that's incredible. Like, that's a, you know, some amazing eroticism if you can think about, you know, a wheat field and, and get excited. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but, so your your spouse may not, and I've, I've certainly worked with plenty of women who it's a completely new idea because they've been taught not to think sexual thoughts. And maybe it also just wasn't intuitive. It's not like something that it occurred to them to play with sexual uh, fantasy. And even if your spouse masturbated, it doesn't necessarily mean that they were having sexual thoughts, right? It can be around just the sensation of sexuality. But this may well be another version of the question I just um, answered, which is, I don't have any fantasies, is also kind of a way of saying, I don't want to show you my mind. Because it might, if your spouse were saying, look, I don't really have any fantasies, but I'll tell you a good wheat field, I don't <laughs> get off on that. And, uh, you know, or like, if they were showing a lot of their sexuality and what they like, that's somebody who's engaged and wants, wants to be in that conversation and wants to figure out what would work for the two of you, as opposed to, I don't have any fantasies. It's, it sounds a little like, um, I don't want you to map me. Even if I'm embarrassed, I don't have any fantasies and that's what I don't want you to map. It's like, I don't, I don't, I want to be kind of at arm's length in this conversation. And it can be really tricky because it's such an invitation to pursue more when you're the higher desire person and just be met with the resistance because it's really hard to, how do you get somebody to want something they don't want? So one of the, you know, questions that I talk a lot about in the courses and especially in enhancing sexual intimacy is really looking at what is the dynamic that we keep playing out and what is the meaning of that dynamic? Um, how well am I doing dealing with what's true in the marriage versus what I wish were true? And so, you know, when we go over and try to get our spouse to reveal their mind or get our spouse to want sex or try to get our spouse to want to be ravished or whatever it is, we are, in a sense, stepping over the line in an understandable way, but we're stepping over the line in a way that keeps it exactly in the position that it's been in forever. That is, it keeps the dynamic of pursuing and distancing happening as opposed to a more self-revealing position 
and taking deeper responsibility for oneself. And so it's the higher desire person that's often in the most difficult position because they can't make another person want them, but also they have in many ways the most power to change the dynamic by not um, not trying to, how to say it, convince the other person to want what you want as the higher desire person. So um, somebody asked this question, and I'll just go straight to it right now, and then I can come back. So, so somebody says, what concrete examples or exercises, I'm sorry, I don't quite the what concrete examples of exercises or couples work? Okay, got it. Can you give for both higher desire and lower desire spouses to work together and separately to mitigate their desire differences and use the discrepancy to grow closer? So, so first, you have to have two people who want to create something better in the sexual realm and who are willing to be honest enough and self-confronting enough to do it, right? Um, because often the person can be low desire for sex and low desire for addressing it. Or somebody can be high desire for sex and low desire for addressing why the lower desire person doesn't want to have it, right? Who doesn't want to have sex. So you have to be willing to say, okay, we have a problem and we're both willing to really deal with what's true here enough and have enough ego puncture here to get enough truth on the table between us that we can start to solve for this difference, that we can start to create something together that's desirable for two of us, not just for one of us. And so you have to have, I can give you some things of what you can do when you have two people who want to make it better. But before that, you have to deal, what do you do when you have only one person that wants to make it better? And what I would say is it's in some sense, it, and it's not just about saying this line, okay? It's that you have to deal with the fact inside of yourself that it appears that there's only one of you that wants what you want. <laughs> it appears that your spouse doesn't want the same thing. And you keep trying to get them to want the same thing. And rather than try and get them to want the same thing, it might be better for you to both deal with the fact that they don't want the same thing. And really deal with it. Okay. Rather than you want the wrong thing. It is what you appear to want. And because as long as you're busy trying to get them to want something else, they don't have to actually deal with their position. Does that make sense? Because the onus is on you still. And so you have to tolerate, I may not get what I want in this marriage. And I may have hard choices I have to make about how I handle myself. But unless you do deal with that, often the dynamic will not shift. Now, so that might sound like I, let me go back to the first question. Um, I, it feels pretty evident to me. You told me you feel no desire. You don't want to be there. So, so that might be two people that want to work on it. I don't know. I would start with the question of how do you make sense of not liking it? Of not really wanting to be there. Now, she may not, she might be like, I don't know, my body just doesn't seem to. So I might say, like, I've been thinking about it, or Jennifer said that it could be a function of not really wanting to step in and be more exposed either to me or to your sexuality. Um, what do you think about that? Now, let's say she was like, this is what I think about it. This is where I think that's true, or I don't think it's true. You know, then you have a collaborative conversation happening. If it's like, um, I don't want to have this conversation. It's making me uncomfortable. I don't like talking about sex and, and you always want it. And why are you always bringing it up? And of course you went and asked that question because you're always thinking about sex. Uh, then you're, then you would want to be able to address within yourself and within the marriage that I think I keep trying to get you to want something that you really don't want. 
and that I can tell. I mean, it's hard for me to know exactly where your conversation level would be, but let's say that you don't have a partner who wants this. Then naming that, not to punish, not to tell them they're a loser for not wanting the right thing, but to deal with the fact that they don't want it and what that means to you. And then the question of, am I going to keep trying to convince somebody to want something that they don't want? Or am I going to figure out how to handle the fact that my spouse wants a limited amount of intimacy or a limited amount of engagement and figure out how I'm going, what I'm going to do about that for myself? Because if you are taking it on, they don't have to. And if you stop taking it on, it pushes the other person to sort out. See, if you're a low desire, you don't have to figure out the question of desire because you always are desired. And I'm not suggesting you manipulate anything. I promise you it won't work because people are too smart for that. If it's just manipulative, you'll just be in an ongoing power struggle for life. It's whether or not you're willing to stop doing more than half the work if you are with somebody who doesn't do their half. Now, if you're with somebody who's saying, I just, I don't like the sex we're having, it's not that interesting to me. It's not that exciting for me, but they want something better too. And they are willing to have some of these conversations. Then what I would suggest is then you want to start often with the low desire person and say, what is undesirable about sex for you? Like what's happening within you that you don't like? And I don't mean it's an interrogation, but you're trying to get more data onto the table in front of you so you can figure out what would actually be more mutually desirable. And you're handling your ego and your disappointment, right? Um, you know, I work with a couple where she's higher desire. She's been chronically low desire for a really long time, but has started to really move into a more collaborative position. With my help, I'm facilitating the conversation of, what's been undesirable about it for you. And as soon as she starts to answer, he just kind of loses it. Okay. He just gets defensive and talks over her and explains why it's really truly her fault, not his fault, because if she'd been more A, B, and C, he wouldn't do that. And there may be some truth in all those things, but the truth is he doesn't want intimacy because he can't handle actually hearing the way that she's experienced sex and the ways that she's experienced him. It doesn't mean it's all his fault, but if they're going to solve it, they got to get it out there and start parsing out who's responsible for what. And, you know, not in a defensive way, but in a collaborative way, like, you know, um, for example, you know, she's saying, I don't feel cared about. I feel like you resent me for what I don't give you, but I don't feel like you're actually invested in my life. That you just care about me being happy. So it's really hard to want to open up to you because I feel all your entitlement and like you should have, you've been owed this forever. And whatever I do is never going to be enough because you have this deep sense that you're owed something. And I don't feel that you actually care about me other than how it serves you. Now, I think that is incredibly on point for this particular couple, but it requires a lot of willingness to see oneself and how one is experienced to sort out what good sex would actually look like with your spouse. What do they know by not liking the sex you're having? What do they know about bad sex? And what do they actually know about good sex? And, you know, I work with a lot of people where they're hired. They're, they're wanting their spouse to tell them all their fantasies. That's when they're going to really be mature and they're going to be really willing to talk about how to be have a better sex life. And there's nothing wrong with sharing fantasies. But what they don't see is that their spouse is trying to tell them what would be really good sex, like this, this client was. It would mean me feeling cared about just in the day-to-day -day of life more. Feeling like you actually want my success. You want my well-being. And um, because it wasn't in the form that fit with what he desired, right? 
he was having a hard time actually hearing what would make sex desirable and better for her and therefore for them. Okay, Chrissy, are there any questions coming in specific to these points? There are some that go back to sure. what we were talking about a little bit earlier. Let me, okay. find, sorry, um, let's see. It said, Jennifer, how do we learn to say, how do we learn how to say the words you said? Most of us are just not skilled, equipped enough to be so honest and vulnerable, especially if we're already hurting or feeling rejected. What do we do to be that brave? Is therapy the only way to raise these issues? Well, you know, honestly, in the, in the course, like the strength in your relationship course, I'm really trying to help people to see what, what is the work I have to do? So a lot of the, the kind of conventional knowledge out there is these are the techniques for having a conversation that ultimately is going to get you what you want, right? Use I statements, keep it concrete. And, and there's nothing wrong with those like pointers for like, this helps you not get into a reactive mess when you have a conversation with your partner. That's true. But the goal isn't manipulating your partner into giving you what you want. The, the, the way I say that, I mean, yes, I have practice. I've done it a lot, but it's also moving into a mind, right? That can sustain itself in the face of the invalidation of that conversation. Does that make sense? So I'm going to get to the practice part in just a second here, but but so much of what I'm trying to teach in the course is how do I get better at handling myself when I'm disappointed, at handling ego puncturing information, at calming myself down when my spouse is telling me something I don't want to have be true or deal with. I want them to deal with what I have to say. I don't want to deal with what they're saying. And so it, it's so much in calming ourselves down and self-confronting that we start developing, we're doing the soul work that that we need to be capable of an intimate partnership, right? Going back to the client I was talking about who gets so reactive, he says he wants intimacy, but he has zero interest in intimacy. He wants reinforcement. Intimacy takes a lot of courage. <laughs> intimacy is looking at how, not just how your spouse is a, is a problem, but how you're a problem in your current configuration of a relationship. And so it has so much to do with growing ourselves up relative to what's true. And as we get more and more able to accommodate what's true, we get more able to hold on to it in these difficult conversations. We get more able to hold on to it when our spouse sees it a different way. We're more able to reference our honest self. One thing you can do is write out a conversation with your spouse. And if you follow the Room for Two podcast, sometimes I have clients, uh, people on the podcast write a conversation that they have. And then I go in and, and I kind of decode the conversation. Um, but the way it could be helpful for you is that to think about where's a really tricky conversation that we tend to have, me and my spouse. Like, where do we tend to just go off the rails or I go off the rails and I want to get clearer minded. Then I would practice by writing out the conversation. This is what I would say if I were being honest and kind and courageous, right? Going to say what I really think we need to deal with as a couple. What would my spouse say in return? Okay. And okay. And then let's, let's just say he for this, for the sake of this conversation, let's say he said, okay, something that's really dismissive is not taking you seriously. Okay. You're going to feel while you're writing out the conversation, you're going to feel your mind going into reaction. Like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe he says <laughs> now you have a, you will now don't have to actually deal with your spouse right now. You can calm your mind down, self soothe and think about how do I bring my best self? How do I stay honest with myself, honest with my partner and compassionate and respond to this by compassion? I mean, you're not getting indecent but you're speaking what you believe is honest and true in response. And if I were to say that, what would they say? And the reason why this matters is because your spouse is going to be trying to negotiate, like all spouses, right, are going to try to keep the meaning negotiated at the level that you're both accustomed to. 
And so if you're coming in with more honesty, more truth, it's going to be dysregulating to both of you because your minds aren't accustomed to holding on to it yet. And your spouse is going to be trying to push you back into the negotiated meaning that you both are familiar with. And so that's why it's an exercise and a workout to actually just practice in a written conversation because it's going to be pushing your mind to get clear around the meaning that you usually collapse into, but that don't help you as a couple. But I think that could be a very helpful way to really look at what you tend to do under pressure, what your spouse does under pressure, and to get to keep practicing bringing more of your honest self into the engagement. Somebody just said, so do you just guess what your spouse would say? Yes. And by guess, what's so amazing is whenever I have clients write these things out, they actually, when they go and have the actual conversation with their spouse, they're like, it's like, it was like almost word for word what I wrote. And the reason is because we know our spouses very well, or sometimes people will write them out with like they're a parent. Your mind kind of knows like more or less what a typical response will be. Now you might say, well, I feel bad saying that they're going to say something that maybe they wouldn't say that. And that's okay. It's not how to say it. you're not saying, I know my spouse would say this. What you're doing is you're getting your mind to get clear around invalidating responses. And so when your spouse comes in with an invalidating response that you could anticipate, okay, whether or not you're right, but nonetheless, your mind could anticipate it. How is it going to deal with that response? Now, it doesn't mean like you just say, oh, it's the wrong response. Like, where are they right? What's honest about that? Where do they have a point? What do I think, though, is missing in that or that I think matters for us in solving this? So, therefore, how would I respond? Yeah, exactly. So, so you're not trying to get them to give a mature response. In fact, you're trying to get what you think they would do on a regular day or even a bad day because you're letting your mind practice getting clarity. Yeah. Yeah. Now, you could, you know, I also know couples where once they sort of have done some of that, then they graduate to an actual written conversation rather than trying to do it in real time around really challenging topics. Because then it allows them to be like, okay, breathe it down, calm down, self confront. Uh, what do I think is a fair and honest response here? Because so much when we go limbic and we're just in our own reactivity, we just have the hardest time doing anything productive. And so the more you can calm down and find your courageous, honest self, the more likely something meaningful can shift. Anything else, Christy, that's a follow up? Yeah, someone was asking if you could talk more about the smothering dynamic and how to um, get past the two reasons for avoidance that you mentioned. So a while ago, you talked about smothering dynamics. So yeah. if you could speak more to that. Yeah. Good. Okay. So the question of smothering, I've worked with couples where one is in pursuit and one is distancing. And, um, you know, I worked with the low desire person for a while around, you know, you're not really stepping in, but she just couldn't really see it because she felt smothered. He was confronting more of his own behavior, shifted it. She still wasn't stepping in. The short of it is, it's really when he stopped pursuing, but it was really coming out of his stronger self. He stopped trying to convince her to want it. Um, that that's when she was like, just more able to see herself, more able to see what she was doing, more able to see that she was playing out something her mother did her whole life. Just didn't wasn't at peace with being in that position and wasn't at peace with the sexual nature of the relationship ending. You know, um, this is a story I've told before. And so maybe some of you have heard it, but he was just like, look, I'm not going to leave the marriage, but I'm going to stop trying to make it something that you don't want it to be. I don't want to try and make this into a sexual relationship anymore. If your answer is no, I'll take no for an answer. When the kids are out of the house, maybe we'll do something different. But for now, I, I'm going to stop trying to get you to want this. 
And that just totally changed everything because she had no interest in it not being a desire-based marriage. She just didn't have to deal with her desirelessness. And it's not like she was scheming. Like she really felt no desire. She really hated sex. It's just that once it turned into her choice and it was a real choice to make, um, she didn't want to be that woman. She didn't want to be walled off. She didn't want to be uh, in a sexless marriage. She didn't want to not be wanted. And so she started to step in against her fear and her body started responding and she'd never orgasmed up to that point and had tried all the things I'd said, but saying nothing works, nothing works, nothing works. But she also, a big part of her didn't want it to work. You know, she was afraid of being kind of consumed in marriage. She'd had a mother who very much was in a martyr position. She knew how to do martyr very well. And she felt a kind of safety in being the martyr, the long suffering one, not the desirous, sexy one. That was, there was no template for that whatsoever. And so once she was being let off the hook for the martyr position, he's saying, I'm not going to make you do anything you don't want to do anymore. That then she could see, I don't want that persona anyway. And I don't respect it and I want to do something different. And so when she was actually stepping in and choosing it, her body was coming along with her. And so, but that's what it, it takes. It, it takes an, a, a willingness to self confront and to step in, you know, I, for those of you who followed my work, like I, when my husband and I were dating, I was always in the kind of wall leaning out. I wanted to be wanted. I didn't want to desire. I didn't want the exposure, the vulnerability, the risk that then he would think he could do better if I did step in. And, um, and yet I had to confront that I was making myself miserable and him miserable by wanting some supposed safety of not really choosing. And it was, and so it just kind of came up against my own integrity and the potential of losing the relationship because I think he was starting to say, like, maybe I need to let it go and let this be what it is. And I, you know, and then I stepped in in a different way and everything changed. Everything changed in me, between us. It was just a hundred times better of a relationship once there were two people choosing it. So we want the safety of leaning out and there's no safety in it. It just, it's the worst. <laughs> it really, I mean, it looks like it's the best. You don't have to be, you don't have to have any skin in the game and you get desired, but you don't have the joy and the happiness of a rich friendship. You don't have the self-respect of knowing that you're not taking advantage of another person and that you're actually bringing your best to them. And, you know, if you're polluting the relational air by not actually, by, by always being in a kind of walled distance position, you invite the smothering that you don't like, and you also don't like who you are. And so you're, you're, you don't like the dynamic of the marriage is, is not a happy one. So, and then to the religious part, well, you just have to, you know, I will work working on a book, finishing a book that's really taking on that question of whether or not sexuality is, you know, godly. I'm basically making the case for the fact that sexuality and spirituality are deeply related to one another. It's only when we're in our young development that we see them as sex as antithetical to goodness and to spirituality. And, you know, a lot of people think it for good reasons. They grew up in environments where sex was unsafe, that there was perpetration, that there was parents with deep, deep anxieties and taught them that God was a God that hated sex. And, you know, a lot of people have been immersed in that way of thinking. And it's very, very foreign to imagine that sexuality could be anything but an indulgent, excessive, you know, um, choice or something that makes you unsafe. And so it, you know, it, it's comes through, you know, my coursework is very much around challenging that idea and showing how deeply we have a theology that embraces the body and embraces sexuality and sees it as a part of our spiritual development. And what we do with our embodiment matters, right? It, it either creates light and goodness in us or it creates darkness and, and, and closing down. So, um, so you have to, you you come to accept sexuality by making good choices within it that accrue to your well-being and to the well-being of your partnership.
that's how you come to peace with sexuality is through how you engage with it. And if you're always running away from it, or you're being indulgent and, and dishonest, you're never going to be in an honest peace with sexuality because you haven't learned how to create goodness with it yet. So these are the very quick responses, but uh, and so our time is up, but um, I enjoyed talking at all of you. <laughs> Sorry. It's very nice to have you all here. And um, Jennifer, if this is, if desire, if desire differences are the root problem for a couple, what course would you would recommend? You, would, would you recommend or yeah, tell me the order of course. Gosh, okay. So that is to say, you feel like you have a good friendship, good relationship, but there's just this issue around desire and sexuality. If that's the case, I would, I would do, I would start with each of the individual sexuality courses. So art of desire and art of loving and do them separately, but simultaneously. You can, you can certainly listen in on the other course if you want to, but like affording your spouse the time to kind of just deal with the question of sexuality, but not as a partnership yet. And then do the couples course, the enhancing sexual intimacy course. So that's how I would do it if I were you. Now, if you're just ready to tackle it as a couple and you feel like you, you can start with it, they're all good. I mean, you're not going to, it's not, there's not really a wrong order. You can start with the couples course and then you will probably want to, to do the individual courses as well. Yeah. Thank you. That's perfect. Yeah. Good. All right. Well, thank you everybody. I think if, I don't know if there, how many people here are fully new to me, but if you want to just know more about the way, I think there's lots of free podcasts um, where you can learn more about these issues of desire dynamics and sexuality. And of course the online courses uh, will really teach you how to relate to these questions in a new way that allow you to grow into somebody who's capable of both emotional intimacy and sexual intimacy. I also wanted to point people to your YouTube channel that has, yeah. you've done a Facebook live on this before. So yeah, yeah. if you have questions about any of Jennifer's resources, you can always email me office at finlayson-fife.com. She has hundreds of hours of free content and some really amazing courses. I worked through all of them and I love them all. So there you go. Great. Awesome. <laughs> okay. Thanks everybody. Hope you have a good night.